All right, my friends, we have a very special live stream where Audioholics and Audio Advice teaming up with Anthem. We're going to be talking about the best calibration and setup tips for Arc Genesis. We got a user, Teo Nicolakis, one of our primary reviewers of Audioholics. And Scott, do I need to introduce you or do you want to introduce yourself? Why don't you do it, Gene? <laughs> Scott Noonan is the heart of audio advice, man. He is just unbelievable the way he runs a tight ship. But what I love about this is even though he's in the business side of things, he's an audiophile at heart. And you are in the trenches. You're doing the calibrations yourself. You're testing the equipment. You're endorsing that the equipment is good before you sell it. I really appreciate that. And then you bring on a heavyweight, Blake Altley from anthem and and paradigm blake it's awesome to have you here on our live stream heard Happy many be here. things about what you do at anthem yeah fortunately blake and i have spent many late nights with his team going through alpha software prior to the launch of all these great products we're going to go through here so i'm super super stoked to have him in this conversation uh now looking back with such great great products out there Thanks. Awesome. I think we should kick this off. But, you know, we have there's a bunch of Anthem uh, room correction calibration stuff on YouTube. I've done videos. You've done videos. And I think it's just good to kind of do a succinct thing here of what people should do after they run ARC. But before they even run ARC, maybe they could tweak stuff in their room to get better results in ARC. And I think that's really what people are looking for here is they just don't want to have to rerun this thing 10 times. Right. We want to try to simplify the process because that's one of the advantages of ARC Genesis. In my experience, I've, I've checked out all the room correction systems. And in my opinion, I feel like ARC Genesis is, is one of the quickest and easiest ones to get set up right. Like you could run ARC and you can get pretty good results without with very little tweaking and very little fuss. And that's what I really appreciate the simplicity of it. Yeah, there's no question in this last generation, it made a leap forward, uh, both in ease of use, but also in the final output in mm -hmm. the product that is, you know, truly amazing. Yep. Yeah. So Teo, I'm going to share the screen if you want great. to uh, go over the slide stuff. Sounds great. Well, I got to tell you, it's exciting to be here. And we have an Anthem AVM 90 in the house. And it is spectacular. So I'm excited to, to be here with everything. So Scott, why don't we talk a little bit about the lineup? So let me kick that over to you so we can talk about uh, what you can have for hardware to take advantage of Arc Genesis. Yeah, as, the, as the retailer on here, we had to have a couple slides to make sure everyone was oriented. So obviously there's the receiver side um, where you've got 7.2 preamp with five amp at the 540. Everything is 8K now. Everything has all the Arc Genesis you're gonna hear us talking about today. And then you can step up to the 740 and then 1140 is so considered sort of the Mac Daddy within the receiver line with full 5.2 capability. And those are discrete subs out on that point too. Um, so pretty amazing. That one, by the way, is like a, a tremendously high seller because People can go get all their amp channels today, but know that they've got future capability to bring in additional amplification and grow it. So uh, that's the AVR lineup. And then in terms of the processors, the AVM70 came out first and, you know, was a huge success. And then when the 90 came out, um, as you might expect, I was like one of the first people to get the 90 was testing before it came out. And I fell in love with it. I've had, as you might imagine, I've, I've had virtually every processor you could have in my own theater. And today I have the AVM 90 and it is truly incredible. Um, in addition to those 15 channels, it has four discrete subs and uh, an incredible set of DACs on it that we'll talk a little bit uh, about later. I'll chime in. I have owned every iteration of an Anthem Pre Pro since the AVM 20. So I've had the 20, the 50, 50 V, 60. And the one thing that really impressed me now that I've had the 90 and for about four to six weeks is really how Anthem has done such a great job of making this a streaming first platform. So what you have here is you have built in airplay, Chromecast, Spotify Connect, Bluetooth, and even Rune coming soon. So those of you who saw the show that I did here on Auto Audioholics Live with uh, Enno Vandermeer, got a real deep dive into Rune. But Blake, I don't know if you want to make any uh, comments on the native Rune integration. Yeah, it's, it's something we're working on currently. Um, we hope to have it out soon. Um, I don't have a ton more information on that or any specific dates to give, but it's um, we're just trying to make, trying to make sure we get everything right. Um, 
but I, I do like pointing out that even though Rune Ready is not uh, on the units uh, right now, um, we do have the ability to cast and airplay through Rune. So if you're a Rune user, you can still get your audio, just not through the Rune Ready directly. Agreed. And what I do, as I mentioned on the show, is I actually have my Rune server connected uh, via HDMI or via an endpoint. So it's the same thing you get Rune automatically uh, on your AVM. So I don't know if you guys want to talk a little bit more about some of the tech features that make this such a special pre-pro. Yeah, maybe jump to the next slide. And Blake, you can just give sort of the overview, talk a little bit about the DAX and, and go from there. Yeah. Yeah, so we saw the opportunity with this series um, after the, well, I'll start a bit back with the previous series where we came out with a pre-pro in the uh, neck, came out next with the MRXs to share a chassis and some of the same platforms to make it more of a cost effective uh, pre-pro. Um, but this, this this series, we saw an opportunity to come out with a even even higher level above what we had the AVM60 to now to the AVM70 through the AVM90. Um, so we decided to throw whatever we could at this um, while, while trying to keep it still reasonably priced you know, within what it is. So we were able to upgrade the DAX to the best we had available. So we've got a pair of uh, 9038 Pros to power all the main channels and a pair of 9038 Q2Ms for the subs with separate DAX for zone two. Um, we upgraded the DAC board uh, from a four layer board to a six layer board. Wow. Um, the, the ES9038 uh, Pros also have their specific voltage regulators upgraded on the um, of AVM90. We've got precision resistors at 0.1%. We've got upgraded op amps. Um, we, we did everything we could that would have a realistic benefit to the user. Um, and that included the, the four subs with the individual measurements and phase alignments with them. And it's fantastic. I Just so everybody knows, I have my AVM60 on an XLR switcher with the 90. The difference is stunning. You can easily tell the difference between the two. So anybody who's been hedging their bets about should I uh, upgrade from a 60 to a 90? It's a no brainer. It's really magic. You're talking about doing just a two channel comparison, right? Oh yeah, because yeah. as we know, for those of you, just to be clear, you can really tell the difference uh, in two channel. Once you start adding multi-channel, it really confuses your ability to um, yep. distinguish everything. Two channel is really where you start to see the magic. It's transparent. There's and I'll get into this more when I ha get to the review, but it's really special. Yeah, it was so really like, cool. I called, uh, I called Teo right after. I don't know how long you had. It wasn't that long. And, the, and as soon as I called him, I was like, okay, how's it going? How are you enjoying the ABM 90? And his first thing was, oh, I'm playing a two-channel. And it's, it is an incredible <laughs> two-channel processor. I was like, yeah. So Teo and I are both really into great audio. And so the fact that you can have in your theater room not just a great theater, but a great two-channel system is pretty cool. Yeah, so Blake, the, just to be clear, the AVM90 actually has an upgraded DAC over even the uh, MRX 1140 receiver, right? Oh, most definitely. Um, yeah. It has it has the best DAC uh, available out of all of them. So there, um, we we scale up as we go through the line with a lot of parts. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. some of the parts are are common, but the AVM90 has the the, the, the benefits I just listed previously are all uh, unique to the AVM90. So just to interject some objective data here, I did the bench test of the, of the 1140 receiver. And I found the strongest point of that receiver was actually the preamp output on that was extremely clean and the DAC was really good. And that wasn't even the upgrade that we're talking about in the AVM 90. So I, I would love to bench test one of those for sure. It, it makes my salon twos sing like they have never done before. I mean, it's magic. It really is. Sweet. All right. So why don't we talk a little bit about ARC? How's that? So Maybe y'all don't want to hear this, but we got to tell you what the practical thing is, is you need to get the setup right in order to get your ARC results right. So I, I want to emphasize a couple of things. If you can, go do a room analysis. And uh, Vicoustic does this for you. It's for a fee, but they'll give you these amazing renderings. This is a rendering of my theater room after Vicoustic did it. Uh, Gick will do some. And, and try to get the right room treatments because the less work ARC has to do, the better the results will be. So Scott, I don't know if you want to talk about that, but I have a little show and tell too, so people can see like what these Vicoustic panels are similar. Yeah, I'll like. just I'll just give a couple of comments so you can show the show and tell. So we're, Audio Advice is the seller of Vicoustics. For those of you that are DIY, and um, we're the online seller nationwide for it. And there's a lot of great stores that carry them if you've got a great store near you. Uh, but they have great products. I, 
I, I can't see you now, but I think you're holding up a cinema round, yeah. which is got yeah, uh, um, around that I'm putting in my, yeah, uh, and that's in my about theater. four inches uh, deep at the thickest part. And then yeah. it has a curvature on it. And then you've got a mixed diffuser. You want to show your VMT as yep. well. So that that's absorptive. And then he's got a VMT, which has got both diffusive and absorptive capabilities. And uh, you didn't do a diffuser, did you, in there as well? Those are the two. Uh, no, because my, my ceiling's too low. So that's the benefit of doing, again, the analysis is you get it professionally done and then they match the right product. So if you see on the slide here, that's my room and that's the product that matches uh, based on the analysis. So I think the, the primary point that uh, Teo and I wanted to point out here is that the first thing you want to do is get your room right. And then you want to run ARC. So I think a very common misperception is you can walk into a room and, and probably acoustic treatment is the thing that's left out the most that shouldn't be. And uh, there's a lot of great retailers that can work with you or you can work with Audio Advice and we can get analysis done with via by acoustic competitor. And I think it's important to mention a lot of people will set up, they think room acoustics is putting one inch fuzz around the room. That's actually more harmful than no room treatment at all because it's acting yeah. like you're just killing all the high frequencies. So you really need to have, when Scott was talking about the thickness, the viacoustics thickness is up to almost like three and a half, four inches thick. That's more effective to treat down lower frequencies, more broadband, and not just kill everything above seven kilohertz. Yep. Right. So uh, let's see. I'm a, I ended up putting this slide out of order, so I apologize. But why don't I do this? Let's let's go this for the best practices. Mm -hmm. Proper speaker placement. I, I can't emphasize this enough, especially for the front two channels. So if there's anything you really want to be focused in on, is make sure you get your life, your left and right, your mains in order, and be sure that you test that with the proper imaging setup. Make sure the timbre sounds good. And really spend some time listening to two-channel music. Are you getting the right imaging with the vocals? That's going to make such a huge difference overall in a multi-channel setup because your left and right speakers are really where you want to put some of that effort in the setup. I know, Scott, we talked about some other things you wanted to talk about as well uh, in the pre-setup. of. Yeah, uh, if you want to jump to the next slide, um, I'll, I'll just sort of summarize a few key points here and then you can jump in uh, wherever you want to. But when you when you're done, let's say you've, you've set up your room, you've got your speakers where you want. And, you know, if you're setting up a new room, I would encourage you a very easy place to start is go to Audio Advice. We have a free home theater design tool that does all the calculations for the angles of the Atmos for all of the different speakers. That's a pretty. Uh, oh, someone someone is someone has used this here, <laughs> but yep. it does all the amazing. Math tool for you. Yeah. Thank you, David. Much appreciated. But that's a good place to start. And then, but, but now let's say you've installed it all and you're getting ready to do ARC. Um, as many of you have probably seen the home theater videos I put out of, we, you know, we're constantly doing a home theater and then I'll shoot a video in there. But when I shoot those videos, um, one of the things I do is I calibrate the rooms. And so our, our technicians have already calibrated them. I go back and recalibrate. And so I've had the, the benefit of calibrating a lot of different rooms shapes, sizes with good acoustic treatment, not so good. And uh, what I found is the number one mistake people seem to make um, is that when they run ARC, they don't set up the room the way it will be when they're listening. So I'll give you an example. You've got a room and when you actually watch a movie in the room, you're going to close the back door. You're going to drop all the shapes, all the shades in there. You're going to close the drapes and the cabinets are going to be closed where you got your equipment. Instead, you've just installed everything. The cabinets are open. The doors open in the back. The shades are up and you run arc. Now you've got all these reflections going on everywhere. And the room is different than you would do. Even down to this is not just really interesting thing. In the video I did where I teach people how to do this and I walk you through sort of the arc steps. One of the points I made was make sure that the microphone can hear from each speaker. However, there's a nuance to this, which is many people, if you look at the image that Teo has up on the screen, if you follow that 100 or 110 degrees with your side speakers, oftentimes they will be blocked. Mm -hmm. So if you're sitting in the center in a home theater chair, the two chairs on either side of you are blocking those. So I did a bunch of tests running the mic exactly where your ears would be versus pushing it up higher where I could hear them. It turns out ARC does an incredible job actually putting it where your ears would be. And because it, it 
can see the, you know, where the blocks are and everything else, it makes the correct adjustment. So what I would say is if you're going to always be leaned back in your chairs, lean the chairs back, put them where they're going to be, set up the room, turn off your HVAC, turn off all your fans, get the noise floor low, really low, and then run it. So that, that's, if you do that, your end results can be way better. And Scott, um, to your point, when you're setting up your side and back channels, I know uh, because especially when you're dealing with immersive audio, you want your bed layers, you know, at ear level. So you have better separation with your heights. But in most cases, because of the problems with theater chairs absorbing too much, especially from behind you, I like to have the tweeter level, maybe a foot or two above seated ear level position to kind of help offset that problem, too. So we so do the exact same thing. Yeah. Uh, our home theater tool pushes the tweeter just above where it plays over the average home theater chair. Yep. And we generally, it, it depends on the math of the AI, how many speakers you got, where you're putting them, the design of the room. But most of the time when it designs a room, it will move the side speakers up slightly forward so that you can hear them and they're not hitting mm -hmm. the back of the chairs. Yep. Um, can I point one more thing out as well? You had mentioned, Scott, with um, the room, making the room, uh, adjusting it to what you would be when you listen to it. Uh, the the AVM and the MRXs all have the ability to run up to four ARC profiles um, per unit. So if you do have multiple room configurations that you use, uh, for example, closing all the blinds during the day and opening them up during the night, you can run ARC multiple times for the different uh, essentially uh, acoustic scenarios that you have that you'll be listening to to music or movies in. Yeah, that that and let me I'll add another thing to that. This is probably getting a little bit ahead, Teo, in your sort of slides, but I think I this is important to mention. Yeah. We're going to move around a little bit here, but but to follow up since Blake brought that up, a common problem is that people confuse measurements and profiles. And so um, when you go into ARC, you have the ability to do measurements. And this is sort of the first thing you sort of set up. And measurements for most people will be just one. In other words, you will measure the room one time and then you can set up profiles that say, I want my home theater profile that has all the speakers. And you can set a second profile, not remeasuring, that says this is my stereo profile and just use your left and right. However, to Blake's point, um, if you have a scenario like in my own room, I have an open theater room that we use for Super Bowl parties, but also can be used for you know critical listening. So I actually do the measurements twice measuring it once with the room set up like a Super Bowl party where every all the shades are open and the doors open and all these things are different. And then I remeasure with everything set up where I've got to close down for a you know critical listening. So anyways, just know as you're going through this, because I, I hear people all the time, they'll call all devices and say, I got the anthem, I'm super excited. And they're talking about profiles and they really need measurements. But just know right. most people, it's one measurement. A measurement relates to how the room is set up. So if you want to set up for two different instances, then you would do two different measurements. And as Blake said, you can do four different profiles mixed with measurements. So we got a quick super chat here. I just wanted to throw up here from Nicholas. Uh, does the space does the spatial cue data change in the mains when switching two channel to multi channel? I use Dolby surround up mixing with my ninety. It's incredibly immersive. I don't even know if I have surrounds on with music. So I'm not um, I'm not 100 sure what he's asking. Spatial cue. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm not 100 positive, but no. When you when you switch between those, your your arc profile is not going to adjust anything unless unless you had done remeasurement. So that that won't change. Yeah. So your levels and your EQ should be the same whether it's two channels running or all your channels running, and the phase alignment, all that stuff should still be unchanged. Yeah. Okay. I hope that answers your question, Nicholas. Well, the only thing that could be different, trying to think through with you guys on this, is if you set up a second profile with a separate measurement, then you you could have some things that look yes. different in your two-channel versus multi-channel. 100%. Yeah. And when then when you do right, upmix, right. the base level can go up a little bit just from the nature of upmix. Yeah. And so you might want to set, if you're going to do an upmix um, for two-channel music, you might want to set up another profile that either knocks the subwoofer level down or maybe raises it up if you want more bass when you listen to multi-channel music. So that's definitely something you could consider doing. Great. Well, let's quickly cover common mistakes, like what you shouldn't do, which is also important. Uh, from what I understand, and I really want to give a shout out to David Lawson. David Lawson's an AVM 90 user. We've become good friends over this in a short period of time. 
and he's done he says about a thousand different arc uh recommendations for folks on avs forum and his results have been great well one of the things that he's seen and i would agree from my anecdotal is setting up subs improperly is really where you can find that out and and there's a couple of things where you can do that improperly is a just having the wrong location for your sub and arc does come with a tool to help you do that but number two is we know that you have peaks and nulls. Sometimes your peak with room gain can go way, way up, and then you'll be above 80 and a half dB. If you have a peak that that's high and you just leave it, that can also affect your arc measurement. So you really want to be attentive to setting up your subs the right way and also with volume. So volume is, is the other thing that we want to be uh, careful of. And then there's something with the new units you, you want to be attentive to, especially if you have a 7.x.4 setup. And that's at the height speakers. Don't go by physical location. So if you have front height and rear height, those rear heights are not height three. They go in order. So height one is the front and then whatever the next height channel. So if it's the rear, it's actually mm -hmm. height two. So be aware of that. Um, otherwise, you might crash arc. And you might be wondering what's going on is there has to be a specific, um, the, the proper integration of how you have the speakers configured in the pre-outs. And uh, then don't let ARC do everything. Let the science be the science. So don't jack it up to 20 kilohertz. Leave ARC at five kilohertz. Let it do its thing. We'll, we'll explain a little bit about why that is. But ARC doesn't want to mess with your speakers. And it really wants to handle those lower frequencies because once you start getting into those higher frequencies, A, the microphone starts to get directional, but there are certain use cases where you do want to um, calibrate at a higher um, frequency. And we'll talk about that, but you really just want to let, again, let the science be the science. Yeah. If you have linear speakers, you shouldn't really need full bandwidth correction. So that's, that's a topic for another video, but I, I agree with you, Tay. I think the best results are typically when you, limit arc to five kilohertz or below. Sometimes I limit it only to 500 hertz and I just take care yeah. of the base. Yeah. Right. And you can yeah, test your results you with multiple profiles. When, when we have uh, customers reach out and something doesn't sound right, oftentimes it's because they left on the um, crossover on the sub. And so now yeah. you basically got the crossover trying to work in arc and you've got yeah, the gang together to turn all that off on the sub and usually that's a quick call like to our support hey it's not sounding right you know i got this thing from you guys and i followed it and like one of the first questions is did you turn off these capabilities on the sub first oh i didn't and then it's usually fixed yeah use the lfe input on your sub if you have one that usually bypasses its own base management yeah right it's a great tip and um so why don't we get into quick measure a little bit fair so quick measure is one of the tools that everybody needs to be aware of. It's been there since arc one. So it's been there for almost whatever it is, 13 years, but so many enthusiasts don't know what it's there for. And arc is really there to help you with your uh, arc quick measures there with your pre-configuration. So number one, what it'll do is it'll run test tones to help you see what the response is in the room. So especially for subs, you want to run the test tones. And what you can do is you can choose an individual speaker, not just the sub, to see what that response is like. And what's really great, especially if you're looking at a product like the AVM 90 or even the 70 and you're running multiple subs, you can see where you have nulls in your room and then you can place a second or third or a fourth sub to address where that null is. So that way, when ARC does all the calibration of all the subs together, you're getting a uniform response at the main listening position or again, at multiple listening positions if it's in a the theater space. So it's really a fantastic tool. You don't need to use REW. That's the thing is Anthem's done an amazing job of making mm -hmm. a complex process super simple, efficient. And the newer version, and that's the uh, graphic that I have in the lower right-hand corner, now has a new feature where you can actually compare the ARC corrections. So I haven't tested it out fully yet, but it's there. You can make a slider, rerun a sweep, and then you can see the impact of ARC after you've uploaded the uh, calibration on how that affect us. It's, it's really, really cool. So Teo, I've actually works. tested that pretty extensively. And here's a fascinating thing. You can have situations and maybe some people that eventually are watching tonight or watch this video another time. There are situations where um, you're gonna end up with a curve where the, the level that's gonna come out after you've run it is gonna be less than say 70 dB. And those are situations usually where 
uh, there used to be this problem that doesn't exist today, where if you had some speakers with not enough sensitivity or an amplifier that didn't have as much and it couldn't add enough gain. Anyways, they fixed all that. But the result of that fix is that some people will come out and say, oh, my gosh, like every speaker is running at 69 dB, which is perfectly fine. And But here's what I did. I've gone through after it's run and then tested every single speaker in almost every room that I go shoot videos in in the my own. It is within one dB of every single speaker, almost every single time coming out of arc. It, it's it's incredible. Nice. Great. So one uh, Scott, one thing since you're a calibrator and Teo, your point about quick measure. What's what's really cool about this? If you only have a laptop and you're going to a customer's house to set up an AVM seventy or ninety, whatever. Switching between ARC and then REW is cumbersome because then you have to pull the USB mic out and you have to put the other one in and then upload REW. You know, you have to keep switching back and forth. That takes a lot of time. The fact that you don't have to do that, you could use the same exact microphone and then use the same software to do your quick measure and make your adjustments real time saves a lot of time in calibrating and tweaking out your post calibration results. Gene, if you can bring up the other shared screen, I I have quick measure up on my Mac, so we can uh, take a look quickly just to show sure. folks and just where it is. So here's once you launch Arc, and maybe you've missed it, but it's actually right here, other tools and launch quick measure. So you just do that. It'll find every single Anthem or Paradigm or Martin Logan product. So there's my, my 60, my, my 90, and then I actually have a Martin Logan uh, amp as well. So then you just select the processor or the unit. It'll load that up. You hit continue. And I don't know why I didn't plug there the it is. You're good. There it is. You have to plug the microphone in. <laughs> you you got, you got it there. There you go. Yeah. And then it loads it up. One point of that is the software is incredibly stable now. Like it's very hard to get these things yeah. super stable because you got to manage across lots of different, you know, software and platforms and PC, you name it. It is yeah. really, really stable. Um, and, and to that point, if you ever find like, oh, I'm trying to run my test tones and they don't run for a second. If you just back up and come right back, they almost always hit right then. Right. So you can choose which profile, which is great. And then you can choose every single speaker in your configuration. So it, I'm not going to do that here now, but you can run yeah. those tones. And then what's really cool is you see where it says take a snapshot. So you run it, let's say, on one of the subs, you take a snapshot, you move the sub, you take another snapshot, and then you can start to compare what the frequency response is. And that's the way you can really dial everything in. So you want to try to get the flattest response or in a multi-sub, if you're stuck with a null, put a second or a third or a fourth sub that's in your configuration in an area where you don't have a null, you have a peak or a linear response. And that way, when ARC does its magic, you're getting um, a good frequency response right across spectrum. So quick question for you, Blake, can you sweep all four subs at the same time in one measurement? I was just thinking that um, uh, I, 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 um, I can't I don't remember see that. right now, if you can right uh, as we used to always do that because it used to be um, just parallel subwoofers. Yeah. Uh, but, but right now, I believe if you have this, if you have this setting set to uh, one sub and you run sub one, uh, it will sweep all of them. But you have to have that setting set in your AVM ninety. Um, that would be a bit of a workaround. But um, if you scroll to the bottom there, I don't believe it has all subs at the same time. It's just a straight option right now. No. So, yeah. so two quick upgrades you could do to the software after we get off this live stream. Of yeah. <laughs> Is have the ability have the ability to sweep all four subs simultaneously that way you know how they're working as a system and i yeah. also like to add in the lcrs or at least the, the left and right together because if people are not base managing their left and right speakers those are now base sources and you want to make sure that everything is acoustically blending with the subs 100 percent. and i'll just make a quick note if you are going to do the arc corrections make sure you do it after you've done the phase adjustment as well because then you're really getting a, a true picture of how the entire system's integrating in. So, and that phase adjustment separates the men from the boys. I mean, Scott, you can talk about how much right. you've tinkered with Mini DSP, yeah. and <laughs> this thing, this thing beat it out, right? Uh, we <laughs> were talking out. about this before the stream went live, and I, you know, I previously had four subs, and I've used a lot of processors, but I was using a Mini DSP um, to manage the four subs. And I thought, well, it's going to be really hard for any software to beat that. And, you know, just calling it what it is, because I love toys, right? I love having stuff that I can <laughs> tweak. Um, Arc has gotten so good at phase aligning. And because it's matching the subs across those front, all the front speakers, 
in anyone you know on the live stream that has done it has done this with arc they pulled out a mini dsp they've run arc they've done it correctly it is mind-boggling how good it is mm -hmm. i mean it is really really good and anyone who if you if you're in an older system that does not have phase alignment today when you make a jump from one of the older processors that you might have bought seven years ago to today you are going to think you just bought a new room i mean it is that tail you you just did all isn't it incredible i it is it is so transparent i will tell you and just quick anecdote i had done this on my svs subs where and I can't tell you how much I've, time I've spent trying to phase align everything. The fact that I can just sit here, hit phase align, and it does it all and all correctly, it's, and it's, it's seamless. You guys really did a great job. I think well, the other advantage too is is doing the room correction in the processor as opposed to a separate box like a mini DSP. And look, I'm not bashing mini DSP. I did a video on mini DSP probably eight years ago. I was one of the first users on YouTube using it. Even though I could get very flat response with mini DSP, getting all my subs aligned using PEQ filters, it looks beautiful in a frequency response graph. What happens is the more PEQ filters you add to an external processor, the more delay it's add and group delay. Right. And you don't necessarily compensate for that with the rest of the speakers. If you don't do that properly, if you don't set the delays to offset that delay from that uh, mini DSP, you're going to get sluggish bass because it's not properly time aligned with your main speakers. You're not going to see that in just a frequency response graph. You're going to need to use a wavelet or an impulse response. And most people aren't doing that. They're just looking at amplitude response. Yeah. And Gene, the great thing about ARC is it's automated all of that process that used to take us hours before. It yeah. does it right. And after you do your calibration, you have the ability to tweak if you know what you're doing to then take it to the next level. Like, that's the beauty of ARC. It knows what to do, what not to do, and what it does, it does right. And it gives you the, the tools to then go to the next level if you need it. Mm -hmm. So maybe what we want to do is we want to go into um, ARC at this point. How's that sound? Okay. And I, and we can do a couple of things. I want to comment on what I do. So we talk about stuff you need to do ahead of time. So I do two things, and I don't know if you all are going to agree with me or not, but so here's, first of all, Anthem products come with a real microphone. So it's not a And a real microphone stand, not a cardboard. And a real product. microphone yeah. stand, <laughs> yeah. too, right? So here's what I do with the stand. And Scott, you did a great job on this with the uh, audio advice video. This stand is height adjustable. And all you have to do is basically uh, take the neck, screw it, open it, and then you can height adjust it. But I do something very specific is I go to my local store and I buy an extra pencil mic holder. So what I try to do is when I'm putting this stand in the main listening position, I try to then put the mic holder right here. And then I use this as the axis of rotation. So I have everything equidistant when I do the rotate the uh, measurements. That's primarily for um, if I'm doing something for myself or two channel listening, because it's a it's a decent width. And I like to do my measurements about uh, 20 inches or so um, when I'm doing a single seat position. The other thing that I will suggest, um, yeah, let me just pop the microphone out so I can show you. So basically what I'm doing is I then have the microphone here. Um, it's in that uh, measurement position. And then all I do is I pop it out and then I put it into the mic holder here oh. and then I can swing it around. There we go. At a uniform position for all my other measurements. Then when I come back to do my phase alignment, I pop it right there and it's in exactly the same spot where I took my main listening position measurement. So, yeah, the cool, the, Teo, the cool part about that is that you make sure you, you when you do that final phase alignment, you're in the exact same position as you were before. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, I tend, as you guys have probably seen in my videos, I tend to do, I do some smaller ones, but most theaters have a couple rows and bigger. And so I'm going like three feet or a little more apart in each one. Right. But that's a pretty cool thing because you are trying to get back to that same point where your ears would be. Blake is going to hate me because I'm giving him homework. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's, it's, a, it's a great point though to that point is this is what i do is then i do a similar thing is i went and I, I bought years ago with arc one i bought this stand this is the type of stand that used to come with arc one with the avm 50 so yeah. when i need to do something that is a broader sweep i do something with a boom arm here and then that's how i do all of my hey well, it looks like a weapon <laughs> everything is a weapon in my house right so here you go 
So just That's make a little cool. bit of an extra investment if you're going to start doing multi-seat or what have you. But I told you I'd come with show and tell, didn't yeah. I, tonight? Nice yeah. to you. All right. And then to show you the differences, I have the different ARC microphones. So you can see what an amazing job ARC has, uh, Anthem has done now. So this is uh, the microphone that came with the 60. Uh, this is the microphone here that comes with uh, the Martin Logan products, the Paradigm, uh, what have you. And then this guy right here is the one that comes with the 70, the 90, and I presume also with the uh, MRX uh, yes. models. So Blake, the unique thing about this microphone is first of all, just the quality difference is amazing. It's a it's yep. a really great mic. But Blake, why don't you comment about this little guy right here? So I don't know if you can read that. It little says, guy. make sure that you have this whole pointed towards the front of the room um, as yeah. you take your measurements. Yeah, so the point of that is, is to accurately capture uh, higher frequencies. Uh, no, normally with ARC, well, not normally, we default to five kilohertz as being the maximum correction frequency. Um, we've always done that um, just because, a, a, as Gene had mentioned before, um, you, you get, you're getting more into speaker correction as you go up above that point. Um, but a lot of people have wanted to measure above that point. We give you the ability to raise that maximum correction frequency. But previously, our microphones were not very reliable beyond five kilohertz. Uh, once you were measuring above there, you might get, if you have unreliable measurements, any corrections you do past that point, uh, aren't, aren't really worth anything because you, you, you can't correct what you haven't accurately captured. So the point of that is the directionality of the microphone is to understand where the microphone is pointed so we can correct for where the frequencies are. The frequencies above five gilohertz if you want to correct above there. So always ensure that that's pointed forward so it can accurately capture those higher frequencies. Um, and then yeah, you'll be able to correct those if, if you'd like. But we still do default to five gilohertz. It's great. Uh, so that explains that if you're doing what I suggested by putting it and rotating with the boom arm, you just have to make sure that you're turning the microphone. So that dot is always facing to the front of the room. So, all right. Um, so why don't we spin up ARC again? So Gene, if you, oh, there we go. You got it shared already. So I'll launch the AVM 90. I'll go back into uh, that screen here. And let's talk a little bit about what we have here. Uh, unlike some other room correction system, ARC, allows you to do up to four measurements. The overwhelming majority of people, you're just going to do one. You're going to do wherever your main listening position is. You're going to put the microphone, and then you're going to do five. But before, before you do that, you have to configure what your system looks like. So ARC needs to know that. So in this case, I'm running a 7.4.6. So you define your units, uh, imperial or metrics, feet or, or metrics. In this case, I have front, middle, and in ceiling. Remember what I mentioned earlier? This is where you would say I have back in ceiling for height two, all right? So that contextualizes the comment earlier. And then what you wanna do here is you have your measurement position. And what's really cool is the measurement position gives you a visual layout. So if it doesn't look right, it isn't right. And then you just go from here as how many uh, positions you wanna do. Uh, the rule of thumb, and Blake, you can correct me if I'm wrong, for the past almost 13 years or whatever it is I've been using ARC since 09, is five really gives you a good enough uh, measurement. And I, yes. I don't know the answer as to what the use case would be when you want to start going more, unless you're trying to sweep a wider area. Uh, well, that's exactly it. it. It's either wider areas, or if you have, uh, let's say, multi-tiered seating, and you want to get capture a lot of different floors because the heights are changing uh, often, uh, that's when you'd step above five. But for most rooms, uh, five is, is, is perfect. Great. And then this is a new feature that is relatively new. I think uh, the last two builds of ARC where it gives you the option to enter in your left speaker distance right at this screen. So mm -hmm. that's what that is. And mm -hmm. then you can do different measurements. So I typically do two measurements. I do one that's a an Atmos or multi-channel, and then I do something that's a separate uh, two-channel uh, measurement at that point. So give me one second, because I'm on the Mac, and I think this closed out my file. Yeah. So while you're doing that, quick question for you, Blake. Have you guys, uh, I know when I was testing the beta version, it was giving you the distances were confusing because there were like relative distances. Has that been, Yeah. do you actually see the physical distance now when it runs ARC in the software if you have the final release? You do. Um, you, you, now, yeah. you do get it now. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that was a confusing one we, we struggled with for a bit. We were we were planning on leaving it, but it definitely became too confusing just to leave it as a I actually I was testing beta with you know Gabe. I'm sure you know Gabe from Maximum. I, Gabe, yeah. I think he's on here now. I call him up after I'm running beta. I go, dude, Arc is messing up all the distances of my speakers. <laughs> he's like, No, it's right, it's right, it's the software. You got beta. I'm like, okay. Well, Here's the other thing. It. The the yeah. distances are incredibly accurate. So yeah. in the earlier versions of this, when it was all relative distances. Obviously, people would call and be confused, and it was right. And now that it's the absolute distances, uh, generally what I would tell people, people will call sometimes, and they might see that the sub looks like it's the wrong distance or something else yeah. because there's some delay. That's that There's other things happening. Yeah. Don't change the distances that are get you. Right. Okay, so yeah. if you want to do – sorry, go ahead, Jane. Oh, uh, I would, that's an important point, Scott. Um, if your subwoofer distance is different than the physical difference, most likely it's because of the DSP processing internal to the sub. It, Exactly. I, I, we, we often refer to that as it's the acoustic dis distance of the subwoofer, not the right. physical distance. Because it, and, and by the, for noise. most subs, it's bouncing around 10 milliseconds or so. But anyways, right. that, that's, yeah. So you're talking about 10 feet approximately or something. Mm -hmm. So so screen one, your device settings we talked about. And then these are your profiles. Remember, we talked about profiles before. So you can name your profile. So that way, when you're looking at it in the AVR or pre-pro, uh, you can see what it is. So in this case, I do two measurements. So I do an Atmos measurement. And then what I did is I did one that's just a 2.4. So it measured my four subs uh, with the Salon 2s. And then if you do more measurements, you can do that. Now, you might say, hey, I like to do X, Y, Z. Hold that. We're going to show you. You can do one measurement and then actually do different configurations, which are called profiles. That's a lot of power um, inherent in ARC. So then the next screen is pretty simple. You uh, go ahead. So if I was doing an actual calibration, it would have me select my mic and then it would move me, move me through. Now, I do want to pause on this screen for a second because this is really cool. These are all the measurements after I've done them. I have speakers coming in and out all the time. Sometimes I love to tweak the position of speakers, you don't have to remeasure everything if you've done that. So let's say, uh-oh, I don't like the way the sub sound or gee, you know what? The front left and right speaker, let me fool with the positioning. No problem. What you do is you open up your ARC file, you come back to the screen and now look at what you do. You select the speakers. Now what you can do is you can remeasure a single speaker a single position of a single speaker if you think it was off and whatever you highlight in green, then when you go forward and you do a remeasure, it will remeasure only that speaker or only that position of that speaker. Yeah. This is That a saves a lot of fabulous. time, especially when yeah. you have 11 more or more speakers. Yeah. Yeah, we saw that as a, 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 a need when we got to Atmos and the channel count grew so large that remeasuring a whole room would just be ridiculous. So <laughs> try to save people some time. Damn, Taylor, you got some gain in that room. Oh, oh, there's no question about it. <laughs> there's no question about it. Plus with the salons. Oh, yeah, but that's that's a different story here. And I just in case anyone's wondering, my salon twos also have a contour setting to accommodate for boundary uh, room gain. And it's off in this case. So I have not compensated for the salon twos, but they do play full range, as you can see. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're the same thing. So no matter how many profiles you have, you can do the same thing. So, you, so it saves you a ton of time. By the way, ARC is fast. It's super fast regardless. Um, and then you can go into the settings. So once you have this, uh, all your measurements done, this is where you really get some, some great magic. You can do different profiles, but you can use a single measurement for doing different profiles. So because I did two measurements, I can use this profile and then I can call it uh, at most, I can do a 2.2 channel or a 2.4. You can then uh, turn speakers on and off per profile. And then when you get to uh, doing your actual uh, targets, you can then change for each profile to do different settings. So I, I hope that made sense because I threw a lot of stuff out there. Blake mm -hmm. or Scott or Gene, anything you want to add to that? Uh no, I, I think you captured that pretty well. I think the only thing that may be confusing when we talk about that is having an Atmos and a 2.4 channel setup. Because as we said before, um, you could have the same. If the, if the speaker positions don't change and your room right. doesn't change, the Atmos and 2.4 could be using the same measurements. And then you just disable all the extra speakers in the 2.4 that you're not using for that for that profile. But um, yeah. no, I think you said everything right. Yeah. Great. 
Great, great, great. So I have four profiles set up and just for the sake of argument, so everybody can see that. Now, how do you yeah. switch between those profiles? Do you do on the, uh, on the phone app or do you do it on like, how do you do it? What's the easiest way to change your profile when you're, when you're sitting in your theater room and you want to go from profile one uh, to profile two? No, I, I would say the easiest way, because we have uh, virtual inputs, you can create up to 30 virtual yeah. inputs. You could create two that are identical. And within those, choose one profile, one for one, profile two for the other one. That way you can switch inputs back and forth. Um, I, I will mention that we do have um, the API does include the commands to be able to change those per input while you're there but but it, it's a it's a menu change so let's say you're watching your blu-ray which is hdmi one and you're on profile one and you mm -hmm. change it with your control four system to profile two uh, that input now is on profile two so if you leave it and come back to it it's there but it doesn't stay constant as you switch between inputs so if you want to compare them the easiest is just to set up mimicking inputs with different profiles so a, a practical example of doing this in my system i have two kaleidoscape inputs one that is for listening for the whole theater and everyone else. And I have another one that is a profile when it's just me in a specific location and I'm only using certain speakers. And um, I have another profile for Spotify when I'm streaming Spotify, when I've got a big party and I've been playing all channel stereo through the room and then two channel when I want to just have it for me. And there's a good example of that. You just set it up as a different input change the profile, and then you can also change whether you're doing all channel or you're doing you know, Dolby up next or whatever else. So, yeah. yeah. Just a real quick uh, comment I want to address. I've actually used your app. It still works. I don't know if you guys have been updating it or not, but I've had pretty good success with it, um, especially if you want to switch between up mixes. It's just kind of a quick way to do it from the Yep. From the That's app. a good question that they're pointing out, though, because you, you have to use uh, – it's a beta to yeah. run with the newer You're right. Yeah, it is a beta. It's using yeah. for people. So you have to um, use, yeah, anyway, go ahead, Blake, if you want to comment. Yeah, I, I can quickly comment on that. Um, so we've been working real hard to make sure those were live. I, I, it, they're definitely coming a bit later than we wanted them to. Um, we haven't made the announcement yet, but I, I could just tell who's watching here that if you go to the Android version, it is uh, full release now that is available. Um, we, we just had a couple of minor bugs we we're tweaking uh, to make sure it works with older models as well and STR and, and the different series we have. Um, we're set to release the iOS one uh, very soon. We're just, um, just waiting on some approvals. Um, and then as soon as that's out, we'll, we'll put an announcement out. But if you're an Android user, that is that is ready to go now for, for all Anthem products that use um, that, that can be operated over IP control. It, important uh, nuance for iOS users. If you try to use the old app, it will not find the AVM 90 or the newer ones. So you have to download test flight and the yes. beta. That's the key. Test flight and the beta, it loads just fine and you're golden. And, and if you have any questions on how to do that, the instructions are all on the website right now. Mm -hmm. So you can go there. We'll walk you through Great. it step by step. So I, I want to go back to what we we're talking about here. So what I did is I changed my configuration, my profile. So I did one measurement at most. And I'm going to show you how to turn all speakers on and off. And then I left the fourth profile to be just that two channel uh, measurement that, that I did. So you select the measurement to use. If you only do one measurement, you do that. It would be however many speakers. And then uh, I think it, sorry, I think I crashed ARC, not it crashed. You crashed I ARC. Crashed it. Yeah, well, <laughs> and that's the problem of running all simultaneously. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well, I'd see if you can pull that back up. But the, yep. um, what happens is, you better show this really quick, but I'll just walk people through it while you're pulling it up. When you jump to the next step, for each profile, you simply choose which speakers you want. So it would be very common to say, I want these, I want my left and right for my two channel, and or I want my left and right plus these four subs. And then for my full whole house, I'm going to choose all these. And it's super simple. Just click, 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 click. Yeah. There we go. I'm back. Well, I think, uh, Teo, if you want to jump to, because we're getting close to the hour, I think we should talk about room gain and, and the high pass filter function. I saw a question in here before is how do you calibrate a sub below 20 hertz when there's a high pass filter already engaged? And Blake, um, you could address this a little bit too. My theory on that is I tend to disable the high pass filter because most subs already have a high pass built in to protect the driver. Yeah. Or at the very minimum, bring it down to 6 dB per octave because I think if I'm if I'm not mistaken, at least with the beta, I think it was second or third order that it uh, 
that it does by default. And that's pretty steep. That's a pretty steep high pass filter that'll really lob off the base below 20 hertz. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we have all the options in there uh, just to protect anything. We don't want to be sending signals out to subs that, that may, may not be able to handle it. So you could definitely disable that to, to get the correction as low as possible. But uh, but but similar to the uh, the high frequencies, the low frequencies uh, for microphones become very difficult to, to detect at yeah. a super low level. So so we're unable to correct way, 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 way down low. Yeah, most people but, don't realize when you buy a UMM6 mic, I mean, the, the noise floor on those are is not very good below 20 hertz. So if you do a measurement and you try to really precisely measure 10 hertz, you know, 10 to 20 hertz, you can see that measurement changes pretty rapidly depending on the sweep level because of the noise floor of the microphone. 100%. So maybe what I'll do, I'll just give a 30 second sort of what we hear from consumers when they run it. And then, Tao, you can show, talk about room gain here and, and uh, deep bass boost. Ninety percent of the time, if someone you know buys us from Audio Advice Online, we ship it to them, they set it up, um, everyone just goes, it's great. Then, if in the 10%, if someone calls and says, I want to ship you my thing, it doesn't sound right, almost every time it's because they think the bass is not enough. Usually what we tell them is live with it for a week or two. You've probably been over basing your theater forever and you're used to too much bass. And then a vast majority of people will listen to it and go, oh, it's, you know, actually, it sounds great. Yeah. There's another subsegment that go, no, I want more bass. OK. And from there, I'll let Teo take it, which is what the very common adjustments would be here. Yeah. So to that point, I'll just add. Arc does such a good job with the bass, you typically don't have to touch it. What you do want to pay attention to is the room gain number. It's very common for you to see a number in the threes, and that's a good thing. You might see it slightly higher. In my room, anything above four doesn't sound good. That may not be the case. And Scott, you can speak to other rooms that you've done, but that's typically what you'll see. Because uh, acoustically, we want a little bit more bass in a room. And again, this is the science. That's why Arc sounds so good. So I don't know, Scott, if you want to make comment on the room gain. If not, I want to go to the uh, the deep bass boost. Actually, yeah, I, I have a we'll comment. Just show too. everyone real quickly. <laughs> Hit the positive yeah. sign a couple times just so yep. everyone can see. Yeah, uh, it's shifting the lower part of the curve. You'll see, look at 200 hertz and below. Right. And uh, usually that gets brought up a tiny bit. And there's, you know, if you're doing it at home, just play with it. Try tr take it down to three if you want a little bit more. Take it up to upper threes or four. And then deep bass boost, uh, Taylor, why don't you move to that? Right. And the deep bass boost is something that's new to Anthem Arc. It was not available in prior versions and it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you set what the frequency center is going to be and it's defaulted to 50. I do it at 60 here in my room. And then you can increase this and notice it just does that lower part. It cleans up the mid range significantly and the upper bass. So you don't get that muddy sound. So you get all the bass reinforcement, some of that really great bass, especially if you have high performance subs. And this was just a brilliant addition. Um, so I don't know if you want to comment more about yeah, that. One, one comment on that. When I go calibrate rooms, you might imagine I have some rooms that might have a concrete floor under them. Another one uh, yep. might be plywood. But the point is rooms that transfer the base through the floor into the seats, people typically don't have to push the deep base boost up most. They're, they're feeling it. Yep. And there's, yep. so there's a psycho a psychoacoustic thing going on there. And then in cases where there's not much transference. And I think I can't remember, Gene, you one of these. I think you have less transference in your room. Is that right? Yeah, because my new theater room is a concrete floor. And exactly, I had to raise my base level another two or three dB louder than I did in my old place. Yeah, yeah. So, so if, you just, if you're listening to this and you're playing with your own, just recognize that that uh, transference of energy coming in, you may, be, uh, you may bring that up a little bit and you may get what you're looking for there. And I think it's important to note, Blake, you may, you may want to agree or disagree here. I think it's better to adjust the room gain and then this, the low end base like you're doing here as opposed to just raising the subwoofer level because you're keeping yeah. the correction correct. You're just tilting the frequency spectrum you're, up. I, I would say that's 100% accurate. And I was going to chime in with that at the end. Uh, oftentimes, if people fight, feel like they don't have enough base, I, I'll jump back quickly to Scott's comment before that too, is, is listen to it for a while. I've never had someone come back and, and say that wasn't enough base because they, they just got used to too much base. But if you mm. do want to raise it, rather than it, it, raising the sub level on its own, which if you could imagine looking at this graph would just be that the, the sub line itself raising and be, becoming disconnected yeah. um, fr from the from the mains, 
Um, when you raise the room gain, it raises that with where, where it slow, they slope into each other and your knee region there. So it'll be a much smoother transition than just raising the base on its own. But right. Arc does a very good job of calculating how much base is naturally in your room to make it sound as natural as possible. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you guys a quick, uh, quick, quick pro yeah. tip here that um, let's say you play with this and you're like, oh, my gosh, I think I've totally messed this up. And I didn't write down where I was before. I don't know. If you <laughs> click on that little arrow, see where it says auto detect. If you click that, it's going to take you back to where we were in the beginning. So um, that, that's a quick way for pros that are using it and moving really, really rapidly. And we know our consumers made a bunch of adjustments. I know I messed it all up. Uh, without having to redo everything. So you'll, you'll see those options that sit there. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's great. And for those of you who want to do any tweaking uh, to the subs or an individual channel, you can do that here. So, you know, if you wanted to lower this, let's say to, to be 80 hertz, for some reason, you can do that. And then you can see everything at a glance. So if you're trying to look at what the performance is um, of different subs and where the nulls of the room are based on their placement, it, it gives you the opportunity to do that right here. Uh and, and can I add one thing real quick here? Uh, a mm -hmm. common question that we'd come up with from our tech support guys is people would be, be confused as to why the high frequency extension would go so high in their subwoofer. Um, the reason being we don't, you know, cut these off at, let's say, 80 hertz because, you know, we're, we're crossing your, your speakers over at 80 hertz. Why does my sub have to play above that? It, it's not that it is going to play above that. It's just that we're matching the natural um, uh, slope of your subwoofer in order to not use more correction points mm -hmm. to try and shove this down uh, unnaturally and your, your sub's only going to get information from either a the crossed over signals from your mains or b the lfe channel which is in fact up to generally up to 120 hertz so if that's up to 120 hertz and you're forcing your subwoofers you're taking all your correction points to, sh to cut it off too early you're going to a miss out on some base and b maybe limit the corrections you can do in the more important parts of your sub uh, where it's needed just to push that down for, for no real reason Okay, we got a quick another super chat here. Anthem Logic Cinema has hotter sub base than any other mode. Just wanted to point that out. <laughs> I think that's by design because Anthem Logic is uh, those two modes are also legacy modes that were present in the AVM twenty. So yeah. I'm really showing my gray hairs. Anthem Music and Anthem Cinema, and the Anthem Cinema would give you the um, the center channel. It would actually uh, yep. muck the two, and then it yep. would actually increase the bass by a couple of dB. So. I can yeah, Anthem Logic will give you left plus right to dump it to the center, basically. Right. Uh, so Taylor, real can you quick, go up to the front speakers, real quick. Yeah, you want me to go up here? I just want to show one quick thing um, here because it's a, a this can be confusing to people. We mentioned earlier if you look at the bottom of that section where it says maximum correction frequency, um, it defaults to five k. So we we mentioned when are the cases you would take it up. In my experience, uh, in general. Uh, if it's a room without acoustically transparent screen, very, very seldom do I pull it above that. However, if I've got three speakers behind acoustically transparent screen, mm. we've now modified what's coming out of the speakers. Having tested it on and off and over and over, most of the time I will pull that all the way up for those three speakers. Now, there's an important uh, nuance to this. If you change that, uh, we didn't talk about it, but you see the system-wide target on the left where it says tilt frequency. Just show that real quick, uh, adjusting that tilt frequency. You see that that's changing the upper part of your frequency. And you can also change that on the high frequency roll off. If you change those two, either right there or to go over to the side on the front where it says high frequency roll off. If you change uh, that roll, either of those, which is changing the upper end of the curve, but you do not change the maximum correction frequency, you're not getting what you think you're getting. So just yeah. recognize if you start changing right. stuff, at the upper end of the frequency curve, you're going to have to move this up. And as everyone mentioned earlier, we're generally not trying to do speaker equalization. We're trying to do room equalization with the caveat that there are some situations like acoustically transparent screens where you may want to do it. That's a great point. Yeah. Well, Blake, question I have for you. If you, if you only yeah. want to correct to five kilohertz, mm -hmm. can you go back later if in Scott's case, where you have speakers behind a, a perforated screen there, you lose some high frequencies. Can you go back later, set that to 20K, not rerun the correction, but just add a tilt to get some high frequency extension? You can't do that at all? No, no, sorry. Uh, 100% you can do that. 100%. Oh, okay. Because that's what I'm thinking. Because Scott, I've measured, it depends on the screen. I measured anywhere from 2 to almost 6 dB of loss. Because there's, yeah. a, there's a mesh behind the screen that people don't always account for. 
So if you yeah. want to boost the treble just a little bit to compensate, this is a great tool right here to do that. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think I mentioned before, once you get above 5K, and as Scott said, it, you become speaker correction um, and no longer room correction realistically. However, yeah. if you have the tools at your disposal, you, you, can, you can use them for this. There's no reason not to. We gave you the option to do it, so, so you can use those. So just again, to recap that, if you want to do any kind of tilting, you got to go and switch that slider down all the way up to 20K. Otherwise, even if you're sliding up and down and it's limited to 5K, it's not doing anything. Correct. Correct. Maybe we should switch now to show everybody what the AVM interface looks like and then how you apply these profiles to virtual inputs, because that's probably something people aren't taking a whole lot of advantage on, unless there's something in the chat I can't see that's a question you want to bring up or that we missed. What's the question you want to bring up? No, if there's a question, if somebody has no, a question, that we didn't switched, that's a great idea. Yeah. And we'll try to move great. through it quickly so we don't hold people too long, but that's a great idea. Great. Right. We're actually gaining subscribers right now. There's more people on here now than it was 40 minutes ago. So they're they're liking the content. <laughs> That's great. Well, we got All you right. three smart guys on here, and I'm trying to hang in with you. So. You're just too modest. It's so fun. <laughs> All right. So since this guy only does one screen share at a time, there we go. All right. So can you see uh, this right here? You want the quick main measure one or the other one? Uh, why don't you bring up the main zone, the new one that I just shared up? There we go. Oh, All right. Yeah. So right now we're logged into the AVM 90. And what you see here is in the main zone. So you have main zone and zone two. And then this provides you uh, with your inputs. So you can, uh, uh, do I have to reload? I got this. I got this on a test uh, VLAN. Sorry. So this isn't on my main LAN. Oh, it would help if I turned it on. How's that? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I did find that out, and I, I got a couple of comments on that. That's neither here nor there. So these are these are where your inputs are, and then you everything I'm doing here is through the web interface. But you can also do everything I'm showing you through the app. So there's no problem whatsoever. Uh, we mentioned before about virtual inputs, so you can create up to thirty different inputs, and those inputs can use the same measurements and do different things. And as I've done here, I have them labeled for my testing. I have arc and no arc with the same sources. So that way I just change the, the input and it's done. So let's say I go to um, my OPPO, I have a, a 205 here. Um, then what I can do is I can set what the default mode is going to be. And sorry, I did the wrong thing. There we go, that's where I want it to be. So if I go here to the input, then you set what the video input is gonna be and all this is assignable. Unlike other products, and I wanna emphasize this, the moment you select an HDMI as a source, you can't select it for another input. That's not the case on the Anthem. You could select HDMI 2 for five, six, seven different inputs, and then you can have different audio inputs as well. You could have it be the same HDMI source. You could have digital, optical, analog, and then this is the magic, is the speaker profile. So this looks familiar. Here's what we did before. Here's the Atmos profile that I'd measured. So I'm assigning to this input, this uh, speaker profile and measurement, or I could change whatever it is. I can do this on the fly uh, through the app, but the better way to do it is configure an input. If you want, make a duplicate of that input and then assign a different ARC profile if you want to do testing. So Scott, Blake, I don't know if you want to make any comments on that, but that's like such a powerful feature with the Anthem products. Yeah, I'm going um, to make two small comments on this that I generally I did not talk about, I think, in the in the video I did on how to set all this up. So one is lip sync here. It's worthwhile to go through each of your inputs and set lip sync. And there's actually a video we put on YouTube. It's totally free. You can go watch it. And it's, I spent forever on it. It's got this little clicking and all these eye images. Anyways, it's it's a really good way to get your lip sync. If if you find like you think you're off a little bit, and once you see it's off and drive you nuts, you can go fix that for free and play with it. But the other is the rumble filter. Very few people talk about this. The mm. main usage of the rumble filter is if you set one of your inputs to be a turntable, and you've got acoustic feedback coming back into the stylus. And so you have the feedback coming back from the turntable. You can pull up this rumble filter and stop that acoustic feedback from coming in, which is just freaking cool to be, you know, like you're just really thinking about, my gosh, this is that good just for even two channel kind of stuff. So that's only on the 90, not the 70, right? Because the 70 doesn't have a phono uh, input, I believe. It doesn't have to be uh, a phono input. It, oh, no, it, it, it's, it's for both the AVMs, not the MRXs. That's it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
It's very cool. And then just to make a quick comment, you can uh, upsample analog and you can apply Anthem Arc to analog signals, which mm -hmm. is also very, very cool. Or you can just uh, leave it alone and let the analog, analog uh, signal go right through the great electronics that are embedded in there. And we're capturing that at uh, one ninety two twenty four on these AVMs too. So it's uh, you're not you're not you're not losing anything. We were doing that, and and uh, I will point out that Arc runs at that as well. So Arc doesn't have to downsample anything to be able to run there. Yeah, so that, Blake that, it used to be ninety six. Now it's one ninety two. And people have asked about that because yeah. it used to be that if you had a high resolution audio and you want to run it through Arc, it would downsample it to ninety six. But the reality is, most of us know for ninety six. It, it was people imagining stuff in their minds versus reality <laughs> for many people. Now you're at 192. It, it's, you know, I can't imagine. Yeah. Any, anyways, that's a great improvement in ARC. Let's also mention when I interviewed the ARC folks back, I think it was in 2014, ARC was one of the only products that was uh, doing it at 96 kilohertz. And that's ARC 1. So, you know, every other product was downsampling to 48 kilohertz and some still do. So just mm -hmm. realize what you're getting through Arc is an incredibly high performance. Um, and I'll, I'll just say one other thing that I didn't say earlier. How you start your audio signal, your source matters. It is stunning the audio quality that I have seen out of the AVM 90. And most folks come to this impression is I'm buying a product for the room correction. Room correction is important, but if you don't have the audio circuitry that's there and the audio circuitry is transparent, it doesn't matter what you're putting on top of it. It's just dealing with something that is a bad source. The The audio signal that's coming out of the 90 is just incredibly pristine. So that's all I can tell you on that one. That's my experience. So as we wrap up, just a couple of comments. One, um, there are great stores all around the country that carry Anthem. And if you don't have one and you're, this is getting you fired up to go, oh my gosh, I want to get this and go play with it. Stop by one of the stores. You know, if you're nowhere near a store or you're a DIY, Audio Device would love to help you. Or you can come to Audio Device Live, which is the weekend of August 4th. And we're going to have, there'll be a whole team from Anthem there. And you'll be able to see all this stuff live in action, listen to it, ask questions. Gene's going to come down and probably uh, rock star one of our panels, I'm sure. So. That's always fun. I can't wait for that Audio Vice live event, Scott. I mean, last year was amazing. I can only imagine what it's going to be yeah. like. We've got summer. some uh, fascinating stuff we haven't announced yet that's going to be super cool at it. So it will be bigger and better. Awesome. So before we wrap this up, can I give Blake some more homework? <laughs> I've, got you on a, I've got you on a live stream. I want to give you a little homework. We talked about sweeping four subs. That's really yep. useful for Calibrator. Yeah. We talked about sweeping the LCRs with the subs, either individually yep. or all combined. Yep. Yep. That's a very uh, invaluable. Um, in terms of up mixers, I'm a huge fan of the Dolby Surround up mixer, but the problem is most of the companies now that use height virtualization have gotten rid of a feature called center spread. So when you're up mixing two channel music, it dumps left and right signal into the center channel. And if you're sitting in the main listening position, it kills your stereo image. So can you please get the center spread on and off feature back? Because right now when I use my 1140, I go right to Anthem music mode, which is awesome. But mm -hmm. I do want to hear um, Dolby surround up mix and music for two channel music again. All right, let me look into that for you, Gene. <laughs> no problem. Blake's part development list is like. I got, and, I got a lot of stuff that, right now. One more thing on the 1140. Please let us reassign the AB amps for any surround channel we want because, like like Scott was saying, you get an 1140. Yeah. He did this at his show. He got an 1140, then he got a three channel Anthem amplifier and set it up with the Martin Logan system. It was great. But imagine now taking those AB amps that are in idle, using yeah. those for the heights instead of the, the class D amp, which is only 50 watts. No, I, I completely agree with you there. That's something that um, that we were intending on um, that we that we didn't include in this series. Um, I've looked at the potential of, of, of adding that in as a feature, but that's not something I, I uh, we definitely have right now, or, or I, I can't promise in the future. But it's I, I definitely understand the need for that, and it 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 would be a real benefit to have it on there for sure. Awesome. Well, it could come to the eleven fifty. <laughs> Anyways, look, guys, it's it, uh, Blake. First of all, thank you for jumping on and spending this time yeah. with us. That means a lot. I was happy to. Thank you very Taylor much for having Gene, me. As always, great chatting with you guys. And this is just a really fun call. And 
it's just really great to spend time with other people that love, you know, this space as much as I do. So. Yeah, Blake, it was awesome sitting down with you, Scott. It's always incredible to, to talk to you about this audio geek stuff. And Teo, man, you kept it all together. I love how you do all your PowerPoints and your presentations and your yeah. enthusiasm. I want to go and buy an Anthem product, and I have one right here, but I want to go get another <laughs> one because of you. The 90, uh, it's the real deal. Uh, it really is. Yeah, you took some risk, yeah. Teo, running all that stuff simultaneously in the live stream, and I was like, that's never going to work, but nice work. <laughs> <laughs> Murphy's Law. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, that's a wrap. I appreciate everybody watching on Audio Hawks and Audio Advice. And uh, stay tuned. We're going to be talking more about the Audio Advice live event. Scott, I want to get you on and, and talk about it and start promoting this event and get people all jazzed up about coming August 4th. I believe that's August right. 4th or yeah. 6th. Yep. In Raleigh, North Carolina. Beautiful place to visit. I think that's a wrap. And until next time, my friends, keep learning.